Hello and welcome back to Exploring Psychology Through Science Fiction. Today we're talking about Star Wars. Yes. So Star Wars, for those of you that were born um, somewhere without technology or um, have lived under a rock, Star Wars is the story of Luke Skywalker's journey to stop whining so much and become a man uh, and Jedi. Um, but this movie more so than any that I can remember, has become a part of the entire world culture. But why? Um, why did it resonate so powerfully to multiple generations, um, to people in every part of the world? Um, well, one theory is that it tapped into some underlying themes um, with which everyone could identify. So let me just talk about a couple of uh, different psychologists right now. The first one is Joseph Campbell. Uh, now, Campbell was a psychologist um, that also studied mythology, and he wrote a book called The Hero with a Thousand Faces. And he was looking at mythology and stories from around the world, and he identified several common patterns that run through hero myths. Um, and stories uh, from every part of the world. Uh, and he characterized several basic stages of the hero quest, um, which he called the monomyth. And George Lucas has talked about um, Joseph Campbell's work and, and how he based Star Wars on that idea of the monomyth. Okay, so I mentioned Hero's Journey several times. What is that? Well, for all of us, um, hopefully there's this, this inner drive to become the best person that we can be. Um, and that's really what taps into the hero's journey, that, that we're going to achieve to our full potential, that we're going to save the day, that we're going to make a difference. Um, and so everybody feels that pull to, to be the hero or heroine. Um, I keep saying hero because this was written years ago, uh, back when we were more um, sexist. Um, so when I say hero, I also mean heroine. Um, and we've seen a lot more stories come out that, that do have that feminine um, focus as opposed to it being completely male-dominated. It, it's still mostly males as the heroes, but, but that's changing. Um, and on a side note with that, uh, Princess Leia does not often need to be rescued. Uh, she's the one that's grabbing the gun out of somebody's hand and jumping in there to, to take care of business. And that was, that's one of the, the cool things about Star Wars is that it's, at that time in the 70s, it was already embracing um, women power. So, so that's just kind of an aside there, but... I talk about hero because that's how it was referred to in the book, um, as well as to some of the other references, but, but we're talking about hero, heroine, whatever word you want to use. So the hero's journey is when a person is pulled into the larger world um, and called on to begin a quest to um, go save the day. Uh, and so the hero or heroine is guided by a mentor, um, as well as aided by allies. Uh, and I've given you an article that just kind of summarizes all of this, so I'm just touching on kind of the, uh, the most relevant points. Um, the hero often requires a talisman. So we've talked about, if we're um, using Star Wars as the example here, Luke Skywalker's the hero. He's guided by the mentor, which is Obi-Wan Kenobi. Um, he's got his allies, Han Solo, Chewbacca, R2-D2, C-3PO, Princess Leia, um, that's about it for the first movie. Um, the talisman is the lightsaber. It's this mythical, magical item that connects him to a whole different um, perspective on the universe. Um, it ties into the Force um, and is what he has to learn that he's had no exposure to if he's going to successfully complete his journey. Um, and so he has to complete a series of tests. He has to 
um, rescue the princess. He has to blow up the Death Star. He has to deal with his dad, Darth Vader. Um, he has to deal with the loss of his mentor. So he's got all of these tasks that he has to accomplish in order to uh, fulfill his destiny. Um, and at the end of it, he hopefully accomplishes his tasks, returns home a, a better, a more developed person who saved the day. Okay, so I, I mentioned that um, Joseph Campbell also pulled from some other works, um, and he really relied on a psychologist by the name of Carl Jung, uh, who was a Swiss psychologist who studied under uh, Sigmund Freud, so kind of back at the very beginning of the, the psychology lineage. Um, but Jung had a little bit different slant on the unconscious. Um, and, and he broke it into two different categories, the personal unconscious um, and the collective unconscious. And the collective unconscious is what really set Jung apart. Um, but he felt that there was this universal psychic system um, that we couldn't tap into directly, but that it's identical in all individuals. Um, so it's inherited. Uh, it's, it's where all of our common beliefs arise from. Um, and it consists of what he termed archetypes. So archetypes are unconscious patterns or images um, that emerge um, as images or themes um, and you'll see it in art, in myths, stories, religions, dreams, so on and so forth, that have common themes to them that are shared by everyone. So you can, you can look at archetypes from several different um, perspectives. One is just the different characters or figures. Um, we have a, a mother image. With, if you think of the word mom, not only do you think of your mom, but there's also just kind of a, an underlying perspective or an image that we all have on what a typical mom looks like. And it's the same for father, for child, uh, for God, for the devil, uh, the wise old man, the wise old woman, the trickster, the hero, the shadow, the maiden. These are all common themes that, that for the most part, we share um, not only in our culture, but in every culture. Uh, that, that Jung and Campbell both traveled around talking to different cultures to find the commonalities. And, and they really found that, that these are innate images that we have. That, that if, I, if I were a good artist and I drew a picture of my representation of the, the wise old woman, the matronly leader, the Gaia, people in different cultures would recognize that image. Um, even though they, they have no shared stories with us other than what has um, come from this collective unconscious. Um, other ways of looking at archetypes can be um, events. So the birth theme, uh, death, separation from parents, growing up, marriage, um, unions. Uh, so, uh, and then uh, other themes include like the apocalypse. Um, every culture has a story about the end of the world, uh, the deluge or the flood. Um, almost every culture and religion has a story about the flood. Um, other themes are creation, uh, like we're talking about now, the hero's journey. So there's all of these commonalities that we all really can identify with and tap into. Um, and that's the whole belief behind the collective unconscious. Um, so that's one idea um, or, or one theory as to why Star Wars resonates so well throughout the world is that it did a really good job of tapping into those archetypes. Um, you only need one look at Darth Vader to know that he's the bad guy. Um, you look at Luke Skywalker and he's roughed up blonde hair and chubby little blush cheeks. He looks just like this little hero kid. Um, Han Solo's 
the sidekick. I mean, it's just, we could all identify with these characters. So, that's, that's one thought. Um, but now let me take that theme of, of the hero's journey, because that's what we're really focusing on this week, um, and transition to a more contemporary examination. So, still focusing on the hero's journey of um, that drive to be the best that we can to achieve to our full potential. Um, so, a more um, contemporary psychologist uh, would be Abraham Maslow. And he came up with a hierarchy of needs. So, he said that um, for us to develop as individuals, we need certain, um, we need to accomplish certain things before we can go on to the next level. Um, and so you've, you've all seen this picture um, of Maslow's hierarchy of needs in the shape of a triangle, and I'll post that picture as well. Um, but at the very bottom is physiological needs. Um, and this is just being able to breathe air, have food, drink water, sex, sleep, um, just taking care of all the bodily functions. Um, just to keep us physically alive. The next stage is safety. Um, being able to feel secure, um, both physically but as well as um, financially. Being able to have and maintain employment, having access to resources. Um, just a, a sense of safety. The next stage, so, so you, can't, you can't really feel safe if you're hungry and starving. Um, you can't accomplish the, the higher up orders until you have met those more basic needs. So we have to build on these. Um, so first we have to be able to, to meet our basic needs. We have to feel safe. The third level is uh, love and belonging. So having um, connections with family, developing friendships, uh, developing an intimate relationship, um, but just feeling accepted, loved, and being able to love. The fourth stage is esteem, um, or self-esteem, feeling confidence in yourself um, based on achievement, um, respecting others, having others respect you, um, but just feeling um, like you've sort of you've made it. You are recognized for your achievements, for what you've accomplished. And the final stage is what he termed self-actualization. Um, and this is that high level, I have achieved my full potential, I'm uh, not prejudiced, I'm very understanding, I'm very moral, I've got these creative juices flowing, um, I'm, I can effectively problem solve, um, acceptance, it's just this, I'm, I've got it all figured out for the most part. Uh, now it's, it's funny when I hear somebody say, yeah, I'm, I'm self-actualized, <laughs> uh, because it's, um, it's not about the destination, it's the journey. Uh, this is not something that you check off all the boxes and then, okay, I'm self-actualized. This is a, a lifelong journey to achieve to our full potential. And it doesn't matter how much I have achieved, if I then kick back and sit on my laurels and don't do anything else with the rest of my life, I am probably haven't reached that stage of self-actualization because I haven't reached my full potential. I've done what I had to and now I'm coasting and, and that's not the same. So it's this constant trajectory of growth. And we all have setbacks and we all struggle sometimes, but it's that we're, we're focusing on growth. It's about reaching your potential. Now, how do we, how do, we do that? Um, it's easy to sit back and watch Obi-Wan bring Luke along and he's got his buddies to help him out. Um, but if we pull this back to real life, we all have that that pull, that drive to be the best that we can be. So how do you do it? Um, well, first of all, no one does it by themselves. Um, and unfortunately, Western society, society is really 
emphasized and pushed self-reliance that you've got to do it yourself you've got to you've got to leave the family go out make it on your own um, and that's a, a huge disservice that that we've done to ourselves um, if you look at uh, more of the Eastern cultures uh, there's much more reliance on family on the community on helping each other out and psychologically that's a much more healthy perspective um, so one of the things that I frequently have to work on with people is letting go of that desire to do it all your own do it by yourself um, and recognizing that it's okay to ask for help and it's okay to accept help and you need to do that we can't do it by ourselves so um, where does that help come from well just like in the movie you need a mentor uh, whether it's a parent or a teacher or a boss someone that has stepped in seen the potential in you and tried to guide that tried to help you um, make sure that you're on the right path um, we all need that and if you haven't had that then that's really the first step is you seek that out you you look at somebody that you respect um, or somebody that is a pillar in the community or has meant something to you and you ask them for help on on getting on track on on whatever particular needs you might have at the time another route to take is through therapy when I'm doing therapy I really have it broken into kind of three stages um, and those stages are crisis coping and growth crisis is just somebody suicidal or abusing drugs hardcore or um, so manic that they're out destroying everything um, whatever it is crisis is just getting them stabilized um, keep them alive keep them safe the second stage is coping um, and and that is where you're learning skills to deal with problems more effectively just like we talked about at the beginning of the semester that there are skills that we all need and we don't typically get those taught to us very well we have to figure them out ourselves um, but so teaching coping is the second stage and then the final stage is growth and in therapy I rarely get to that stage because that has typically taken quite a while insurance doesn't pay for that um, so really the, the only people that get to benefit from from doing growth therapy is um, people that are doing self-pay um, but it's in that stage where you're saying you know what I'm doing okay all my basic needs are met um, I'm coping with my problems but now I want to I want some help on becoming the best that I can be on just becoming um, as as good as I can be now the um, one other thought that's kind of related to that um, and is really becoming much more recognized lately is the the idea of a life coach and so the theory behind this is that just like with athletes who need somebody to push them and teach them exactly how to do it and make them work hard to achieve their potential we all could benefit from that being pushed to be our best um, so a life coach focuses on developing a clients overall strengths and abilities um, whether it's to get them further along in their career or in a relationship or lifestyle changes or dealing with emotional um, interactions whatever it is it's somebody that's on your side helping you but also pushing you um, to get as far as you can now the problem with life coach is that it's not regulated it's um, there are starting to be some certified programs but anybody can say hey I'm a life coach now with a psychologist if you're not licensed um, at a doctoral level you can't call yourself a psychologist that's a word that is protected by law so if I'm out advertising my services as a psychologist and I'm not licensed um, there's criminal penalty that goes along with that um, but life coach anybody can say 
I'm a life coach. Rah, rah. Let's go give me money and let's go um, develop you to your full potential. So you have to be very careful about who you identify to do that. Um, and most likely, the reputable ones are going to also have a license in the mental health field, whether it's a, a psychologist or a, a master's level license, such as an LPC or an LCSW. Um, but it's somebody that has training and knows how to work with somebody, um, but has decided to take this focus as opposed to be doing traditional therapy. So, you've got your therapist focusing on growth or your mentor or your life coach. Well, what do you do? What, how do you accomplish this hero's journey? Um, well, there's several skills that, that you need. Um, one is that you have to be able to identify your goals. What is it that you want? What do you want to work toward? I mean, yeah, sure, I'd love to be a billionaire and um, have a McMansion and all these other things. But I need to be able to set realistic goals. I need to be able to identify specifically what I want, not some vague pie-in-the-sky idea. And so that's where having a mentor or a therapist or just a friend that can bounce these things off, uh, that you can bounce them off of, um, to really focus in on what are your actual life goals. And as, the more specific you can get about them, the the better you're going to do. And so that's a skill that you have to develop is learning how to identify and set goals. Um, another skill is planning. So what are the steps necessary to reach your goals? Uh, we've got to break them down into accomplishable tasks. If I say, okay, I'm going to uh, become a medical doctor. So let's go do it, Doogie Howser style. Um, okay, no. You have to, first of all, get through undergrad, usually with a few specific majors. Uh, then there's a whole process of applying to med school. What are the things that you can do to make yourself a, a better candidate for that? So on and so forth. So the more you plan out the little things that you can do, um, the better you're going to do, as well as the more you'll stay focused. If it's just one goal, that's the very end, you're going to be working a really long time before there's any payout. And so if you have lots of smaller goals, you get to accomplish some things where you can give yourself credit, keep yourself invested, and working towards that end goal, but you have to have those smaller goals. Another um, skill that you have to develop is motivation. How committed are you to doing this? Um, what are you willing to do? What are you willing to give up? Um, what do you need to keep going? And so part of that is just what I was saying that you need small short-term goals, um, but you've got to learn how to develop um, the intrinsic motivation, um, what keeps you going uh, yourself, but as well as how to establish the external motivi motivation. Um, getting people on your side, asking them for help, asking them to help you along. Um, but keeping you in, keeping you working towards yourself, because this isn't always fun and easy. Um, if we're talking about developing ourselves to our fullest potential, that means work. That means studying, and that means um, giving up on uh, the fun weekend activities because you really want to do the best that you can on this upcoming test. You want to learn as much as you can. Things like that. Um... So those are three basic skills, goals, planning, and motivation. Another hurdle or roadblock that I see with people a lot of times is the concept of self-acceptance, which is learning to love yourself as you are, um, recognizing that, that you want further improvement, but you're okay with yourself now. Um, people that struggle um, with this typically... Um, have these conditions that they have to meet before they'll give that self-love. I'll love myself when I lose another 20 pounds. I'll love myself when I find somebody to be in a relationship with. I'll love myself when, and this can go on for any number of uh, conditions, but if that's how you're operating, 
you're really going to struggle. Because if I don't love myself now, why is it worth anything to keep working on myself? I need to accept myself, love myself as I am, recognizing that I still have farther to go, but I'm okay with who I am right now. Um, and then finally, the, the last concept to keep in mind is um, ongoing self-assessment. Like I said, this is it's about the journey, not the destination. Um, I don't hit self-actualization and then I'm done. I have to continually be working on myself, taking a, the temperature of myself. How am I doing? Am I dealing with stress well or have I gone back to those old coping strategies again? Am I um, taking care of myself? Do I feel like I love myself? Um, am I working towards my goals or have I gotten sidetracked? Um, so there, there needs to be this constant ongoing reevaluation of ourselves to make sure that we're doing okay because we all slip back into those old patterns, those old habits, um, and, and it takes work to, to keep yourself on the right track. Um, and that means you need to be monitoring yourself. So those are just a few of the um, ideas and concepts that we work on to help facilitate someone's um, hero or heroine journey. Um, so um, that's all I've got to say about that. Um, you've got a, an article to read and then um, also one other short clip um, about Carl Jung. Um, have a good one.